Russia has made its move. Crimea effectively under Moscow's control, leaving beleaguered Ukrainian forces uh, confined to barracks and so far reducing NATO and the European Union to the status of talk shops. So far, yes, there are calls for reprisals and sanctions. They come from a continent, though, that gets one-third of its natural gas from where else but Russia. True, the Moscow stock market nosediving more than 10 percent this Monday, investors running for cover. But how much of it will weigh on the mind of a Kremlin that claims it's merely protecting its citizens? Amid the parallels to Russia's 2008 war with Georgia, some even comparing this to Prague 1968, uh, has Putin once again, though, trumped the West? What response can we expect? And following on that response, what's the outlook for Crimea, for Ukraine, and the rest of Russia's neighbors? Today in the France 24 debate, Putin makes his move, and with us... Uh, uh, to talk about it here on the France 24 debate are France 24's Douglas Herbert, who's been reporting live from the Crimean Peninsula. Um, he uh, joins us from there. Uh, Kurt Volker, executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership and uh, former uh, United States ambassador to NATO. And uh, Joël Gario malam senator, uh, senator here in Paris uh, for the uh, UMP party, uh, representing the French abroad. Uh, also with us, Celestine uh, Bolin, who you can read once a fortnight in the International New York Times, her column. And uh, Dmitry Linick, London Bureau Chief of the Voice of Russia. We're also pleased to be joined by Sergei Markov, uh, Deputy Chair of the Russian Public Forum on International Affairs, former member of the Duma, the France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter, our hashtag F24Debate. Um, I want to begin with you, uh, D Douglas Herbert, because the situation uh, has uh, been uh, evolving, I guess you could say, by the hour, both in chancelleries and also in Crimea. We've had denials now on the part of Russian forces there that they've launched any kind of ultimatum uh, against the Ukrainian forces uh, stationed there. What have you heard on your end? Well, exactly what you're saying, first of all. As for that ultimatum, the uh, the Russian Defense Ministry, and this is now according to Russian media sources, uh, calling it utter nonsense. You know, the the original talk of this ultimatum was uh, a, a Russian news agency report, Interfax, citing someone close to the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. It was hearsay based on hearsay based on hearsay. You have to take everything very prudently. In a story like this, um, a lot of the Russian news agencies in particular have almost, uh, you you, you you almost feel like they've been used at times like as sounding boards to uh, to float uh, sometimes, you know, rumors, theories, uh, supposed facts that turn out to be uh, refuted afterwards. Uh, but what I can tell you is the, the situation in the past couple of days here from where we are in the administrative capital of Crimea, Simferopol, has been really extraordinary. Um, and surreal at the same time. Um, it's not a classic coup d'etat in the sense that, first of all, coup d'etats are typically internal affairs, states against states. Um, this is, it's basically green men in camouflage uniforms who have uh, actually now have their own Twitter a hashtag, the silent ones, because for days we weren't really even allowed to, um, to call them Russians, even though it was the biggest charade in town and just about everyone you spoke to would say, of course they're Russians, uh, and they'd say, you You'd speak to their uh, supporters standing on the sidelines, the pro-Russian elements, and they'd say, Nashi, Ani Nashi, meaning they are ours, they are one of us. So really, the pretense is now all but dropped. Everyone accepts the fact that in some way, shape, or form, these green cam men in camouflage uniforms by bearing no identifying insignia, toting masks, uh, wearing masks, toting uh, machine guns, uh, surrounding the perimeters of military installations uh, throughout uh, Crimea, that these are, in fact, forces aligned in some way, shape, or form with Russia, whether or not they want to officially acknowledge it or wear any identifying insignia. And extraordinary because it's been, if you want me to call it a coup, I won't use that word, I'll use invasion in a sense, it's been sort of a silent invasion, which is by creating facts on the ground, which is essentially what they have done, facts on the ground day after day, uh, you have a situation which almost de facto at this point, uh, Russia has consolidated control of the police, 
the military, the interior ministry, the security installations, and now the big military installations, any last ones that could have possibly remained loyal to the new authorities in Kiev. So truly uh, extraordinary turn of events. And people who've covered wars, who've covered lots of coup d'etats, they say they haven't quite seen anything like this. You, you like it to Prague earlier. People talk about Georgia. They talk even about Moldova. Uh, you go back to Budapest in 56. There's nothing exactly comparable to what we've seen here in Crimea in the past 48 to, 70, 48 to 72 hours. And nothing comparable, Doug, because there haven't been shots fired. It absolutely not. I can't stress enough the fact that we've spent hours over the past two days at a, a couple of military bases, one at Perivalnaya, uh, which is a military and infantry and marine installation, uh, and the other at uh, Bakch uh, Bakcharisai, which is uh, also south of Simferopol. That's more of a, a base where the uh, soldiers are protecting against uh, nuclear chemical weapon attacks. Um, and in both cases. It has simply been on one side of the, the, the perimeter fences. You have had Ukrainian troops uh, standing there, looking out often, facing down, staring down these, uh, and I will call them Russian commandos at this point. On the other side, the men in green camouflage uniform facing each other. Yes, tense. Yes, a direct confrontation, perhaps one of the more tense direct confrontations we've had, but no violence, no shots fired in any way, shape or form. The, the irony is the most aggressive people we saw, um, potentially violent people we saw, are the civilian, the pro-Russian, virulently pro-Russian civilians who have tended to show up at these sites wherever the Russian commandos have been with their machine guns and their masks and sort of standing in front of them, setting up barrages, often appearing in the night, being there. They were there early this morning when we arrived at the Perivalnaya base and while we were going live for a report with France 24, uh, they were very much chanting in the background before we went on air, very aggressive with us. We had to very patiently try to speak them down. They see any Western reporters as being, especially European, as being provocateurs there, out to uh, basically uh, get them and, and, and tell lies about Russia and, 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 and basically speak injustices and untruths about them. So you have, we had to speak very calmly, try to calm them down. And these are the people who are the ones chanting slogans, waving the flags, and being very virulent in many cases. Uh, all around the town, all around Simferopol, in front of parliament, in front of local regional government buildings, in front of the airport, wherever you see these Russian commandos showing up, they are there right alongside them. Uh, we're jo joined by Sergei Markov, a former member of the Duma, deputy chair of the Russian Public Forum on International Affairs. Um, again, when you hear Douglas is reporting, what is the justification for taking over the Crimean Peninsula? It seems as though uh, there hasn't been a threat to uh, Russian nationals or to Russian-speaking nationals. You know, what we have now from our colleagues is uh, pure uh, propaganda and falsification. I don't, don't know. Is uh, this uh, our colleague talking this uh, um, uh, voluntarily or uh, he asked her to do it, but it's pure propaganda which make... Uh, Europe just uh, um, having no real avoid uh, which uh, lead uh, Europe to the uh, deadlock. Europe already supported one war criminal, former Georgian president Mikhail Saakashvili, when he attacked uh, uh, South Ossetia uh, civilians and when he attacked Russian peacekeepers. And uh, also we had we had same uh, propaganda from um, uh, Georgia about uh, Russian aggression and so on. Then it was a report of European Union, which uh, uh, specified that it was a pure aggression of a uh, uh, criminal Mikhail Saakashvili. But where is the... Excuse me, Sergei, I know that you're in Crimea right now. Where is the danger to Russian interests that justifies this intervention? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, what is it? Russia don't want to take Crimea from Ukraine, for sure. You know, we have very big uh, territory. We don't need another territory. Uh, but uh, uh, we have to protect Russian speaking. What we have in Ukraine, we have Kuzeta, which by force have a strong democratic elected Ukrainian president. And now we have Junta in Kiev, who grabs the power, and which minister are clear neo-fascists from the so-called Svoboda party, which 
Klopp's name was Social Nationality Party. It's really uh, strange to see that French democratic politicians uh, support, uh, uh, support uh, neo-Nazis. These neo-Nazis uh, started uh, terror against his political opponents. How you can say about no violence? If, for example, uh, uh, more than 100 of the headquarters of the party of the region have been destroyed, including central um, headquarters. Um, uh, dozens of the headquarters of communist parties also have been destroyed. And even private house of the leader of the communist party of Ukraine uh, have been captured by neo-Nazis, Boeviks, and uh, fired. And uh, um, uh, the head of the Communist Party, you know, uh, was able... Uh, well, sorry, uh, Sergei Markov, to, to where, run, where is this? Is this happening in the Crimean Peninsula? No, this happened in the Kiev. And cry, people in Crimea don't want neo-Nazis, Boeviks, to repeat same in Crimea. All right, it's so really this is pre preventive, and, preventive action is what you're saying? Absolutely. Uh, neo next Boeviks now part of the Kiev junta, and uh, you support not democratic uh, uh, pro-European process. You support junta with um, uh, neo Nazi station part. You support total suppression of political okay. opponent of, uh, of those junta, and of course with key advisal of the uh, Russian language speakers because they know that they are, you know this junta adopted. Two main, two pursuits. One war about freedom of message propaganda. All right, Sergey Markov, I'm going to have to interrupt you, unfortunately, because the quality of the phone line is poor. But uh, we, 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 we hear your message uh, loud and clear. I, I want to get reaction at this point from uh, Kurt Volker. Uh, first of all, Kurt, are you surprised at uh, the way events have unfolded? in the last week in the Crimean Peninsula? Honestly, yes, I am surprised. Um, there's no reason why Russia should have pushed it this far. Uh, there are plenty of ways to assure that the uh, transition in Ukraine is peaceful, that the interests of all the people of Ukraine, all the citizens are respected, and that they're reflected in democratic elections, which have already been scheduled. Um, and for Russia to uh, in, insert uh, military forces, to uh, float out trial balloons about a, um, a, a deadline for attacking Ukrainian forces, uh, none of this needed to happen, and I'm rather surprised at Russia's actions. If I could also take on a few of the points that Mr. Markov said, I think they're important to clarify. The uh, origins of this, of course, were peaceful protests which were attacked by the government. Uh, some 100 people were killed. And then as the protesters fought back, the president of Ukraine, Yanukovych, fled the country. The parliament in Ukraine voted to remove him from office and to put in place a government that was no longer going to attack its own people. And then they went ahead and scheduled elections in order to reestablish the clear legitimacy and rule of law under the constitution of Ukraine. So all of this about threats to Russian citizens or illegality or coup d'etat is just nonsense. Uh, there's something very different going on, which is Ukraine trying to assure its own democratic governments and its own future, and Russia intervening from outside in order to try to prevent that. All right. And uh, do you agree with um, uh, one of your six, uh, another former U.S. Uh, ambassador to NATO, Nicholas Burns, saying this is the most difficult international crisis of Obama's presidency. How, how volatile, how dangerous is it for East-West relations at this point? Could there be? Uh, how much of a flare-up could there be? Well, I think that certainly a flare-up is possible. Certainly a conflict inside Ukraine is possible. Uh, what makes this difficult is that it may be the first time that uh, if Obama again shies away from any kind of military option and instead pursues a negotiating path when it's clear that Putin is already moving down the military road, it could be a tremendous setback for the people of Ukraine and a setback for uh, the direction of Europe that has been moving in a peaceful, democratic, market economic, secure direction ever since 1989. So it is tremendously important. 
I'd say there have been other crises that have been important as well. I think the Syria one is tremendously important, and I think Libya was as well. Uh, and I think what happens in Afghanistan is still important, but now this is one that is immediately on fire and requires a strong response. Joël Garriot-Mélam, this Monday, the UK Foreign Secretary, William Hague, saying that this is the biggest test Europe has faced this century. It is. It's a terrible situation because it is right at all borders. Here we have a country, a people, who was trying to achieve democracy, to fight against corruption, and look at what the reaction we have from Russia, which is... And let me interrupt you on that. We yes. have one, one viewer saying the longer the West waits to take action, the more yeah. self-confident and cocky Russia a will become. Absolutely. There are several aspects. First of all, I'm among these people who felt we had, and I said it on several occasions, we, I said it to the prime minister, to the French prime minister, we have to discuss with Russia. We had to do it on Syria, we had to do it on Ukraine. And I somehow understand the reaction of Russia. I've been living in Eastern European countries for some time, and I know these people, I know the trauma there has been, but I know as well that Russia has felt a bit diminished, offended. It's like an animal which has been hurt and which wants to show its power, its struggle, it's the art of war, and it wants to show that it's strong, it's towards its people. And there has been such a propaganda on Russian television for weeks against the pro-European movements in Ukraine, that the whole Russian people have been fed with that dreadful propaganda against Europe. But also, this is, as well, a strong lesson for us, because within Europe, besides the UK and France, where is European defense? We don't have a strong European defense. We should have it. As so many people said, it's by having a strong defense that you prepare against war. And uh, we feel a bit humiliated uh, as well. Bef bef quickly, before we go to the break, Celestine yeah. Bowen. Um, I mean, I guess I basically think that, um, you know, there is no military option here. And I honestly think um, to sort of say that Obama should be doing more in a kind of a tougher military way is just foolish because it's, that's just not the way this is going to unravel. Secondly, I think that, um, you know, yes, there have been, I think there have been a lot of diplomatic mistakes over the last four months. I think that the West has uh, sort of did not respond adequately on Ukraine's behalf at some points. And I think that I agree that um, there's been a, a neglect, I think, of recognizing that there's strategic and economic interests of Russia which cannot be ignored. And when, when they're uh, we're ignored... Gonna, we're going to talk about e economic interests okay. when we come back. Okay. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. March 2003, U.S. forces invade Iraq for a second time. Since then, 100,000 Iraqis have fled to the United States to escape the conflict. From Boston to San Diego, meet immigrants searching for the American dream. A portrait of Iraqis and Americans marked by war and who share a common destiny. My Beloved Enemy, a web documentary on France24.com.